Um, we're in John's Gospel, chapter 4, going to pick up the reading in verse 7. I will not read all these because, as I mentioned once in a while, we've got a lot of students, ministry students that watch, that listen, and uh, there are usually three different kinds of messages, Bible messages, a topical, which is just a particular subject, and you may use any number of scriptures, a uh, textual uh, message, which means you look at one verse and you preach on that, or something that's called mostly uh, expository, which means a block of scripture. And that's what this would be tonight, if you want to uh, put that in your, in your cap for later. Uh, we're looking at seven verses from John's Gospel, chapter 4, verses 7 through 14. We're thinking about the new you. And we'll just begin with verse 7, where the scripture says, a woman of Samaria comes to draw water, and Jesus says to her, Give me to drink. Why are we looking at this tonight? Uh, one of the main reasons is, as I mentioned to Solomon a little while ago, I was having a prayer time in my office, and it was almost like watching a movie or a video. Um, I saw a book cover, and I saw the name, and I even saw some of the design. And this portion of scripture, along with some others, came to my mind in rapid succession. I thought, well, good gracious, we just got this book done on miracle money. Is this going to be another book? And I think it might be. So I thought, kind of test the waters. How many of you know that things you see in prayer aren't necessarily like the Bible? <laughs> we want to test everything. You know, in a perfect world, they usually are, especially if we're praying and so on. Uh, but something can come from the embers, you know, getting stirred as we're in God's presence. And it may or may not mean a particular thing. So we'll see. But uh, possibly a new book coming out. And this would be a lot of it, uh, this woman at the well. So that's why we're here tonight. I want to look at this um, kind of in two ways. And again, please apply everything we're looking at tonight to yourself. We try to keep Wednesdays very practical, nuts and bolts, uh, gospel and shoe leather type thing. So that's, again, what we're looking at tonight. Sundays are a little different. We're going to look at the old you and then the new you. This lady's the example, and it's really one of these deals where you, you, you look and you look and you keep finding more and more truth, and I trust it will resonate with you like it does with me. I'm still getting some, some good news out of this. So tonight it's a very interesting subject, right? You. Everybody is perked up at that. You may remember that the, the master and his crew were passing through Samaria, and the disciples apparently went on a little shopping trip uh, to, get, uh, to get food and so on. So Jesus, for whatever reason, tarried behind. And then we read this. A woman of Samaria comes to draw water, and Jesus says to her, Give me to drink. Now think about this. This is not a happenstance. This is a, an orchestrated encounter. So when we look at Scripture through the lens of other Scripture, it's very helpful to, to see how this goes. And again, think about yourself. Where and when and how and why did you come to Christ as your Savior? This was an orchestrated encounter because of the way it ends. In other words, this woman was elect. She was one of God's lost sheep, one of his prodigal daughters. And you've probably figured out from your own life experience plus people maybe that you go to church with or in your family, maybe workmates or whatever, that God's got a way of getting to all of us. And he speaks to us in the language that we understand. Um, I don't know whether you've ever heard this. I have as a preacher. One thing about it, if you preach hell uh, and tell people they can escape from hell by making Jesus Savior, if they make that kind of commitment, it'll never last. You know, embracing Christ just because you don't want to go to hell that's the wrong motive, and that will never last. Well, it's lasted for me 50 years at this point, and uh, I didn't want to go to hell, and so <laughs> I wanted to go to heaven instead. I thought I would give hell a hard pass, and guess what? The Lord saved me, and I'm still saved uh, 50 years later. been in the ministry 48 years this fall, so uh, last fall. So uh, we'll just put that aside, and this is how she came back home. First of all, think about this. Just being here with this woman was a no-no for any devout Bible-believing Hebrew. You may recall Samaritans were a mixed race uh, left behind in Palestine after uh, 
both, uh, what would you say, conquests of Israel. The first one, of course, from uh, Assyria in 721 BC. The second, about 150 years later, the uh, Babylonians in 586 BC. And they were kind of a hybrid type people, part pagan, part Jewish. And sadly, then they were hated by both groups. The, 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 the full pagans thought you're half-breeds, and the full Jewish folk thought you're half-breeds. And so this was a bad deal for Jesus to be among uh, someone like this. The, the Samaritans had their own worship. Uh, they, as sh this lady will mention, uh, pointed to a, a mountain called Gerizim, uh, where they, they believed a lot of Bible uh, things that happened regarding Abraham and others, whereas the Israelites... Uh, were more in favor of Mount Moriah or the Temple Mount, as we read about in the New Testament. The other thing was the Samaritans, for whatever reason, did not accept the whole Old Testament as inspired. They believed in the first five books only, whereas a Jewish person believed in the, the Torah, the, first, the law, the first five books, plus the prophets and the poetry books. So there was quite a bit of difference there. And uh, you, you uh, well, we'll get to that in just a tick. Can you identify with her tonight? Does anybody here or anybody watching or listening beside the preacher feel sometimes like you're on the outside looking in? I mentioned that to Barb just today in another connection. I grew up that way. Kind of, I always felt like everybody else knew the rules but me. I always felt like I was an observer. Everybody else knew what to do and what was going on, and I never did. I kind of find out, found out later as I revisited some things, uh, awkward situations in childhood. And guess what? That's where this bad self-image comes from. Normally, from some kind of an unpleasant or awkward or abusive situation in childhood, wrong dad, no dad, wrong mother, missing mother, bad siblings, uncle, whatever, uh, people you're raised with could even be cousins. I've counseled people that were abused by cousins. Uh, the possibilities are nearly endless, but the result for the, the victim is they feel off-brand. They feel like they're from the other side of the tracks, and sometimes they never get over it in this life. Now, here it is. Therefore, the woman, the Samaritan, says to him, how are you, she adds a pronoun here for emphasis, you, being a Jew, asking me, being a Samaritan woman, a drink. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, this begs the question, how did she know he was Jewish? Most Middle Eastern people resemble each other, regardless of what the particulars are in their background. How would she know he was Jewish? I, I personally think it was his accent. Now, we have no record here that they're speaking anything other than the language of the New Testament, Kinney Greek. In the Bible, in the New Testament, when another language is spoken, the writer of that part always mentions what the language is, what the word was, and what it means. We don't have that here. Uh, so Jesus was certainly fluent in Greek growing up in Nazareth, and she would have been fluent in Greek. So how did she know he was Jewish? Because of his accent. You find the same thing in the incident around the passion of Jesus when Peter is brought up short by that servant girl. Remember that story? Hey, you were with him. No, no, I never, never met him. Don't give me that. Your speech betrays you. And depending on what commentary you read, the commentator will usually say, well, see, one thing about it, Jesus had this other dialect of Aramaic, different to the, to the Jews in Jerusalem. Well, guess what? In our inspired Greek New Testament, the lady doesn't say anything about your dialect gives you away, your other Aramaic. She says your speech, literally the way you talk. So it wasn't necessarily a language. It was his accent. And I'll throw this one in free of charge. There are a lot of things in the Bible that get there in terms of commentary because of an a priori assumption. Someone decides in advance what the situation is rather than letting the scripture talk. In my humble opinion, this is one of those cases, and I think we see it again. I believe this lady found his Greek a little different than the one that she spoke. So she knew he was a Jew. Now, let me ask you a question. What is your self-image? <laughs> if, I really, if I really milked this thing, we'd never go home tonight, would we? we we'd have a list of things, right? And it wouldn't be, wouldn't be uh, positive. Abused, loser, re reject, 
stupid, undependable, unlovable, damaged goods, and on and on and on it goes. And this is very, very true of this woman. She had a fleshly mindset or self-image. What do you mean, Pastor? Uh, those of you watching, listening, what do you mean fleshly? What I mean is based on her senses. Her senses tell her, I'm not pure Greek or something pagan. I'm not pure Jewish. I'm a, I'm a mixture. Uh, the nation of Israel, much more powerful, well-known nation than, than mine, calls me an off-brand and a half-breed and calls me a mix and tells me I'm worshiping at the wrong mountain and reading the wrong Bible. I've left some out. So you can understand how that would feed a negative self-image. Now, look at the conversation here. And again, just imagine the Lord's talking to you and you're talking to him. Imagine it's a one-on-one -on -one with the master like she had. Rather than react to this invalid vision she had of herself, Jesus pointed her to the way out of the old her and toward the new her. Think about this. He, he got her looking away from her past and toward a future that she probably couldn't even imagine. Why do battered women go back to the same idiot that put them in the hospital? Or if they drop him, they find somebody just like him. Why is it? What's the mechanism? Uh, is Macho Man just that exciting that they can't you know, stay away? Uh, plenty of other women stay away. It's something in that person. They've got the wrong self-image. How sad. Now, how did he do that? Again, we're looking at John 4, 7 through 14, just going down through the verses. I'm, this is my paraphrase. Assuming, Jesus said, assuming you had known the gift of God and you hadn't. And who it is, the one saying to you, give me to drink, and you hadn't. You would have asked him and he would have given you living water. I love this. I hope you do. Right here again, as we see often in John's gospel, Christianity is not laws it's life. It's not something we can become part of by doing good things and not doing some bad things. It's not about doing, it's about being. And watch this. It comes from a personal encounter. Where would she get the water? From an angel? From an invisible God upstairs someplace or on a vacation real busy? Where, where would she get this? Directly from him. And I think we will see this more and more as we get closer to the return of the Lord. Christianity is an exclusive relationship. It's an exclusive religion. That is to say, it excludes anyone and everyone who refuses to recognize Jesus as God in the flesh and as their Savior and the Messiah of Israel. Anyone outside of that belief system is excluded. And it's not because God's angry at them. It's not because he doesn't love them. Um, if, you're, if you're dying from an infection and you need a particular kind of antibiotic and you, you say, well, you know what? One thing about it, this one's cheaper and you take that one and you die. Is that antibiotic angry at you? The one that you didn't take, the one you need? Of course not. It was your own foolishness, your own stubbornness, your own stupidity, right? That kept you from healing. So Christianity isn't loss, it's life. It comes from Jesus and Jesus alone. It's based on the inner, not the outer. It's based on the supernatural, not the natural. It's, it's based on the spiritual, not the carnal. Now watch this with me. She's still slow on the uptake. Where do we get that cliche, old habits die hard? Where does any cliche come from? From life. This is where we, you and I live on a daily basis. Sir... She called him Kyrie, but it didn't mean Lord for her yet. Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From where then are you having the water, the living one? That's the way she said it to him. So she's, she's getting there. She realizes there must be two kinds of water. You're not talking about this one. You're talking about the living one. And the well is deep. 
Do you know, do you know that was about 100 feet deep, that well that Jacob had dug? And you needed a certain kind of equipment and a certain kind of rope to be able to put your bucket down there and get it back up. And Jesus had none of that. Why? 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 Why is she t still talking to him like this? Because she's still asleep. Anybody here besides me been asleep at the wheel of life? Did you like it? <laughs> I've said it before. The alcoholic. Here I go to the bar again and oh how I hate it. You know, the morning after, the night before, the rug burns on your tongue. What, where, where was I? What did I do? Why, why is that? Because we're on autopilot? Uh, I know it's happened to you, and I can tell you it's happened to me on more than one occasion. I'll be driving along, and I'll pull into a parking lot, and I have no idea why I'm there. What am I, what, what am I doing at Kroger? <laughs> I'm supposed to go to the library, but I saw a familiar street. <laughs> the autopilot kicked in. I was asleep at the wheel. I was awake, but not really. That's what this woman was. She's awake. You know, she knew up, down, left, right. But she was asleep spiritually. So let's kind of move from that old her, and hopefully you're applying this to yourself, the old you, to the new one. And you have here again this concept of, you can look at it different ways, parallel worlds. The world system based on the senses and the real world, uh, God's world. You are not, she's still earthbound. You are not greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and himself drank out of it and his sons and their cattle. What did Jesus do? Get, get into an argument with her? No. Isn't he awesome? I don't know about you, but I wish I was more like Christ. Did you ever see him upset in the Gospels? Did you ever see him ask somebody for advice? Did you ever see him run out of anything? When he was six months behind in temple tax payments, did, did he bite his fingernails off up to his elbows? He, he, wasn't, he wasn't bothered. He's never bothered. Why? He never reacts. He responds. How many here have, have reacted to somebody? Some people, I mean, I'll tell you what, you've met them, I've met them. They're devilish. How do you know, Pastor? I look in the mirror every day. If you know you can be an idiot, why couldn't the other person be an idiot? And what they do is they try to push buttons, and some of them are really skilled at it. Why would somebody do that? Push your button, say something or do something that will get a reaction. It gives them a false feeling of life. If they can get somebody else aggravated, subconsciously, I guess, they think to themselves, oh, I'm here. I, I really am somebody. Look, I said that, ha, 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 and she got mad. And, and, and he, you know, he got mad. Ha, ha. So I, I really am real. It's this false feeling of life, you know, based on getting someone else to do something silly. Jesus never did that. He sidestepped her misunderstanding, and he went right to the crux of the matter. Look at it with me. In my paraphrase, each and every one. The, the one drinking out of the water, and he probably pointed at the well. This one will thirst again. But whoever may drink of the water which I, I will give him. This is really strong. Jesus used a strong double negative. Ooh, me. Shall absolutely not thirst again forever. Wow. But rather the water which I, I will give to him shall become in him a, the word here is P-E, a spring. And that word P-E was used of, by Greeks of either a place where the gods lived or the actual dwelling place of God, like a temple. It will become in him a P-E of water springing up unto life eternal. Now you think she would wake up and smell the coffee at this point, you know, and say, you know what? So I'm Samaritan, he's Jewish, I'm going to look past that, I'm going to look past the accent, I'm going to get right, get, I'm going to get the, the, asp, the uh, what do you call, cotton out of the aspirin bottle. But she didn't. It's Kyrie, but still not meaning Lord. Sir, give me the water, this one that you're talking about, in order that I might not be thirsting nor coming here to draw. I mean, think about it from her point of view. 
You're there once or twice a day, gotta drop that rope down about 100 feet. You don't do that in five minutes. And it's, it gets hot there. Uh, it gets cooler at night if you have to double dip for some reason, no pun intended, but I guess that's what it would be. So here is where, again, Jesus does not take the bait. He doesn't stay on the same plane as she is. Why? He's trying to get her out of the old life into the new life. And no, I've learned this. Philosophers have talked about it. No problem can be solved on its own level. It has, something has to come from outside, from a higher place. And that's where he was. Jesus says to her, he says to you, he says to me, call your husband and come here. Now, <laughs> this is interesting because as you read, Again, if you're just tuning in, we're talking about John's Gospel, chapter 4, verses 7 through 14. Yes, yeah, seven verses. If you keep reading, you find that Jesus was pointing out her Achilles heel. In her case, it was relationships. That's where she was focused. She was focused on relationships. And think about this. She was living uh, Einstein's definition of insanity. Have you heard of that one? <laughs> Doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. Now, you'd think that this girl has gone through five guys already, and she's on number six, and I think that's interesting. If you want to be a little mystical about it, you can say, well, isn't it something? She was on number six, and in the Bible, six is the number of flesh. Six is the number of fallenness. Five is the number of grace. She's on number six. You think maybe after five, you know, toss and a lose, five of those in a, in a row, she might get the common denominator. Hmm. Five different guys, plus the one I have now. Six, hmm, and the same partner, me. Is it possible I don't need a new partner? Is it possible I don't need a new job? Is it possible I don't need a different kind of success or a better quality of health or wealth? Is it possible... I, I don't need another kind of affirmation or affirmation coming from a different kind of person. Is it possible I don't need yet another marriage relationship or another position of power? Maybe in, in the spiritual world this time instead of politics or the armed forces. This is called by one philosopher, and I think he's right, pendulum living, to live like that. If I get affirmed, ah, isn't life great? Boy, the sun looks different today, doesn't it? And then the next day you're rejected. What a bummer. Life stinks. I wish I were dead. And the sun's, same sun's shining. It's the same, same summer, but it's a different you. Pendulum. When things are good, I'm good. When things in the natural are bad, I'm bad. Horrible way to live, but this is where we all are, aren't we? We have no way out. And whatever we look to to complete us, whether it's success, success or health or wealth, positive affirmation from someone, uh, marital relationship, power in some area of life, it gives us a false feeling of life. Again, a, a fleshly plus, but it never lasts. And it's, it, it always disappoints. I can't tell you how many actors I've read about that really what we would call make it. And they wind up drug addicts. Many of them die by their own hand. Musicians, the same thing. Sports stars. Uh, well, we know about wealthy people. 2008 tells us plenty about that. At least two that I know of. One from Germany, one from England. Topped themselves, just ran in front of a train when the market crashed. What a horrible way to live. Again, this is where she is. This is where you and I are until we wake up. And I mean, the good news is, as in this lady's case, she, she's elect. If we're elect, 
if we're one of God's lost sheep, if we're one of his prodigal sons or daughters, he is going to be uh, sending the invitation and then all we have to do is RSVP. And suddenly everything's new. I look back on your own conversion. You know, I've testified about mine numerous times because it was so life-changing. I know we're not saved by feelings, but it sure feels good to be saved. And when I made Jesus Lord, and I, I, I kind of followed Dr. Fraser's in, invitation and told his secretary, Mrs. Brown, I've just made Jesus Lord of my life. When I made that confession after that belief, it was like the sky opened. I mean, literally, physically. I had trouble walking out of that man's office. I, I literally had sea legs. I felt like I was walking through water. And I, I don't remember even being tempted for two or three weeks. I was in another world altogether. If someone would have told me about it, I could have been baptized in the Holy Spirit the same afternoon, but I didn't know about it. And you can't go any farther. Faith goes no farther than revelation from God. So I had to wait two years, sadly. But I'm make, just making the point, I'm sure you can remember your situation. Everything changes. And that's a beautiful thing, and it's a miracle. It doesn't come from anything down here. It comes from something up there. So, again, sadly, she dodged the opportunity. She had the opportunity to switch gears and start speaking to him in his own language, spiritual language. She kept on going, so she brings up a religious topic. Maybe she felt funny. I mean, really, he did point out her failures, right? Six relationships, and throw this one in free of charge. You've had, he says, you've had five. He said, go call your husband. And, of course, she felt funny about that. He said, you've had five husbands, and the one you're with now is not your husband. Um, that's a little confusing, and sadly, I cannot tell you what it means. The word there on the air uh, can be used of male versus female. It can be used of, uh, uh, of uh, a man versus a boy. It can be used of a husband with his wife. And there's no way really to know. So it could be that she had a couple people die on her. She may have been divorced a couple of times. Or she could have just been living common law all six times. We don't know. But certainly the one she was living with then, according to Jesus, um, was not her husband. Same word. But there he says, is not your husband. So it, it, it's kind of like pay your money, take your choice. In any case, she, she was a six-time loser in relationships. And uh, I'm, I'm sure bore the scars of those experiences. So she, again, asked which mountain, you know, Gerizim, which could be seen, they could, she could just point to it, or Moriah, uh, the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And Jesus says this, An hour is coming when neither in the mountain, and he probably pointed this one, nor in Jerusalem shall you worship the Father. And then he goes on to say, you, plural, it means you, plural, you Samaritans, you worship what you have never known. Just imagine that. That's the way Jesus said that. You, you're worshiping someone that you have never known in the past with the result that you still don't know him. He's not questioning their motives. He's simply saying you don't know the true God. Isn't that something? You see how deep just one portion of Scripture can be? Isn't it awesome what we can learn about God, about ourselves, about other people? You can go through religious rites and rituals, feasts, fasts, festivals, uh, rules, rites, rituals, and not know the God you're supposedly interacting with. Literally not know. I was 18 years in a very well-known, large Christian denomination, and I was lost. I was lost. I don't know what your background is. You probably can testify something similar. They had never known with the result that they didn't know right now. Jesus says it exactly opposite about Jewish folk. We know who we worship. We've known him in the past. His name is Yahweh. We know him now. And I love what he says. Um, for salvation is out of the Jews. And I like what Robertson says about that sentence Jesus spoke to her. <clears throat> Even though, by and large, the majority of Jewish folk uh, do not recognize him as their Messiah or the Savior of the world, let us never forget, in his humanity, Jesus was a Jewish person. 
and no, no Israel, no salvation, no Jesus. And we should always be the antithesis to anti-Semitic in our attitude and our actions and our words. Jesus, God in the flesh, after the, his humanity was Jewish. <clears throat> and then he goes on to say in verse 23, here it is, the offer of new life. <clears throat> but an hour is coming and is now when the true worshipers will worship the Father by means of the Spirit even truth, for the Father also seeks such, he uses here a demonstrative pronoun for emphasis, for the Father also seeks such, the ones worshiping him. Worshiping him how? 2,000 years ago, 2,000 years from that, today, people are still trying to tell us, you really want to worship God the right way? You better stop meeting on Sunday. Do what he tells you to do. Have your service Friday night or Saturday morning. It's as clear as a nose on your face. Well, guess what? Jesus didn't seem to get that. You'd think he would have at least said, you worship here. The true worship is in Jerusalem. Which mountain? Neither one. This is hard for religious people. People that cling to something they can do rather than what they can become. And he says here, as any, I don't have it in my notes here, but this is the next thing that he says is, is kind of jarring. He says to her, Pnevma o Theos, Pnevma o Theos. God, as to his nature, is spirit. There's no article, so without the article, it's describing his essence. God, in his essence, is spirit. He's not confined or contained in a mountain, whether it's Moriah or Gerizim or some other place. He is spiritual, and he's the father of spirits, right? Hebrews 12, verse 29. And Jesus is basically saying, Lady, forget about what you've been trying to do to change your old self into a new one. You're never, ever going to find the means through someone else. Breaking news. About the time you catch up with that person that you think completes you, they're on the way to you because they think you're going to complete them. And you, you've got two halves trying to make a whole, and that leaves 100% trouble left over. No, you've got to have two whole people coming together. Then there's a synergy. They, they become together more than they could have been separately. He's basically saying, come home to your father. You're a prodigal daughter. You're a lost sheep. He's waiting Please come home. He will give you a new life that comes from outer space, beyond outer space, and you'll have a new life and a new future. And that's what he's saying to all of us. And that new life of his does not have the words unlovable, off-brand, loser, also ran, wrong side of the tracks, failure, whatever you want to put in there, reject. Um, it, it has none of that. And it never changes. How many are glad about that? It never changes. I, I had a, a bit of a problem this week, and I felt kind of funny about some things. And I got into the presence of God, and the first thing I did was remind myself who he is. I'm so glad, Lord, that you've already forgiven me for any good thing that I didn't do or a wrong thing that I did do, shouldn't have done, any wrong emotion that I expressed, which I shouldn't have. Thank you that it doesn't matter my current situation if I find myself on the side of the road sighing, crying, dying, bruised, beaten, battered, you're still ready, willing, and able to come right down where I am regardless of what the cause of that was. Pour in the oil and the wine, bandage me up, give me transport to a healing place and pay my way. How can you beat a deal like that? What a God we have. And I don't know about you, but I find it absolutely mystifying that when I'm in the presence of God, especially when I've messed something up or, or made a mistake or whatever I think I've failed in, I have that sense that it's as though I'm the only one that's talking to him right now. He's, he's, he's listening only to me, no one else. How in the world can that be? What kind of a mind does he have? But he's a father, a lover, and a giver. How many are glad he doesn't need anything from us? All he does is supply. 
And uh, it's, to me, it's, it's a life-changing situation. Well, why don't we live that way every day? It's because one-third of us has still not been renewed, sadly. So we move forward, you know, emotionally, spiritually, but our natural, physical man weighs us down. Don't you think she had a lot of memories encoded in her gray matter and her DNA about failed relationships? Don't you think other people that chase money have in their DNA, I blew that deal, I can't believe I got fired, I screwed up that, that promotion, whatever world you want to look at. How about the guy in the, the, the what do you call the, I don't follow it, but the ball game, just did the wrong thing or whatever, and uh, kind of messed things up for, uh, for the Bengals. Is that right? Something kind of didn't, yeah, didn't go right, got a penalty. Yeah, uh, you know, that's, it'd be hard to forget about, probably. Um, but the Lord has none of that. He doesn't remember any of that stuff. He's in a different world. We're in a different world, but sadly, we won't be fully in it until we get a new body. I think I went a few minutes over. I hope I haven't put anybody to sleep. Or, or if you're looking for sleep, I hope I did. Any questions on this tonight? Mike. Yeah, um, I wanted to tell you guys that uh, where Jesus tells her, if you knew who you were talking to, I would bring you with the water. Mm-hmm. There's the Holy Spirit. Yes. But how could he give her the Holy Spirit if salvation wasn't available? Right, yeah. Right. It would have been been a promissory note it would yeah it would have been basically you've made the faith transaction an IOU exactly right yeah Um, it it would be just the way anyone else became a child of God while he was once a really good question and yeah he means in general that that's yours once you make the faith commitment Um, and again in John's gospel I love what he says of all the father has given me I will lose not even one and uh, he was giving people to Jesus, you know, dur- during his whole ministry, not counting the old covenant. So, uh, yeah, she wouldn't actually enjoy it till till uh, he rose from the dead. But it wouldn't take wouldn't be long. What was his ministry? Three and a half years. So she wouldn't have had long to wait. But I, I just like the idea of him reaching out, the idea of her being such a loser. It, it gives me hope, hopefully other people that have messed up over and over again or you keep trying to do the same thing to fix yourself. I, I'll be candid with you. I, I just talked to a publisher of mine recently, and they want to publish one or maybe both of these short stories that have already been published somewhere else. I felt really good. You know that you feel really good. Oh, wow, they like my writing. They're going to do it. And then you get a rejection from someone else. <laughs> You know, so you get pumped back up. And you, now, that's only, there's nothing wrong with that. That's normal life, you know. But if that's all we have, if that's all we have, that's not a good thing. But if I can step back and say, you know what, whether I sell a, a story or not, whether I get published or not, it doesn't change the real me, the me that's going to exist in eternity. Where's that magazine going to be? <laughs> Nowhere, right? Where's the novel going to be? Nowhere. Um, where are we going to be? Someplace special, amen. Anybody else? Question, input, output. No, we're going to come around the Lord's table. If you're giving tonight, that's super. We have baskets here, one in the foyer. And let's just remind ourselves of how wonderful he is, amen. And, and we're all, we're all uh, being taken care of just like we're the only ones.